Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the fifth and final day of the 18th Vermont Organics Recycling Summit. I'm Natasha Duarte, the director of the Composting Association of Vermont, and we organize this summit in partnership with the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources. This year, we've organized the summit as a kickoff event for International Compost Awareness Week, which starts this Sunday. And that's the most comprehensive and largest education initiative of the compost industry. And this year's theme is Compost Nature's Climate Champion. And I like to just draw people's attention to the slide or the, the image here on the right. This is by a University of Vermont student from Dr. Deb Nair's Composting Ecology and Management class. This is a, a partnership we've had going for a number of years now. Her class always makes their own versions of, of the ICAW poster and the full collection is available on our website as a gallery uh, at compostingvermont.org forward slash VORS. And if you click on those images, you can read about the students' inspiration and story behind their artistic creations. So that's really fun. And we just like to uh, promote folks to go there and check out the students' work. I'd also like to give a huge thanks uh, to all of our sponsors and exhibitors. These are the people who let us put on a full week's program with the entire virtual program being available free of charge. That's really helped us lower any barriers to access and participation and, and broaden our participation in the summit, which we really value as an organization. Our sponsors this year include Community Bank, Eco Products, Addison County Solid Waste Management District, AgriLab Technologies, Casella, Food Cycler, Viably, Nature Cycle, the Vermont Natural, uh, Vermont Natural Ag Products, CV Compost, the Vermont Produce Program from the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets, and Woods and Laboratories. So join me in giving them a huge virtual thanks for their continued support of this summit and helping us make this week possible. Here we are on Friday, May 3rd, the final day, and we are going to be hearing um, today from EPA's folks about their sustainable management of food and organics recycling efforts. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and ask Juliana to share hers, and I will let you all introduce yourselves. Thank you, Natasha. Hi, I'm Lana Suarez. I lead the sustainable management of food work at the Environmental Protection Agency. We are happy to be here and have the opportunity to share with you some of our work on reducing wasted food. This work is part of EPA's Sustainable Materials Management Program and our work to build a more circular economy. Today, we'll talk about EPA's role, the draft strategy, share some updates on the latest grant programs and share new resources, research, and reports. I'm here with members of our EPA headquarters food team, Juliana Beecher and Amy DeLorenzo. And during this presentation, we'll have some questions for all of you to keep this interactive. Um, and we want you to think about those. Um, and also we're gonna take a few video breaks just to break it up a little bit. So let's get started. First, just a reminder on EPA's role in sustainable management of food. EPA provides funding through grants and cooperative agreements to states, territories, tribes, and communities for infrastructure, outreach, and other programs. We also provide technical assistance, facilitate peer networks, and publish toolkits, guidance, and provide training to help entities across the food system move toward preventing food waste in the first place and make more sustainable choices about how to manage any remaining food waste. Conducting and funding research and providing the latest science and data to the public is another aspect of our work, which helps decision makers who are developing policies, climate planning, or evaluating infrastructure needs. I wanted to talk a little bit about our strategy series. We are developing a series of strategies to support a more circular economy. We released the first part, the National Recycling Strategy in 2021. And then in May of 2023, EPA released the draft national strategy to prevent plastic pollution, which was part two of our series on building a circular economy for all. And then in December at the end of last year, 
our EPA administrator announced the draft national strategy for reducing food loss and waste and recycling organics during the 28th conference of parties, COP28 in Dubai. And that's part three of our series. And we have other strategies that we anticipate developing as well on other topics. This year, we hope to finalize both the plastic strategy and the food loss and waste strategy. And I mentioned the other strategies because organics are relevant in both the recycling and the plastic strategies. The national recycling strategy identifies actions to improve the US recycling system and food is a large part of our municipal solid waste. Improving materials management infrastructure will also address food and other organics pathways. And the plastic strategy calls out the need to develop composting systems and certified compostable materials. Much of food packaging is plastic that serves to protect the product and extend shelf life. We're gonna spend a little more time on just the food loss and waste strategy now. So this strategy is different from the other circular economy strategies because it was an interagency product. EPA is working with the US Department of Agriculture and the Food and Drug Administration to, to develop this strategy. The goal of the national strategy for reducing food loss and waste and recycling organics is to prevent the loss and waste of food, increase recycling of food and other organic materials, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, save households and businesses money, and build cleaner, healthier communities. The strategy identifies concrete steps and complementary EPA, USDA, and FDA actions that will accelerate the prevention of food loss and waste and the recycling of the remaining organics across the entire supply chain. EPA posted this draft strategy for public comment again at the end of last year, and the comment period was open for 60 days and it ended at, in early February. Right now, um, we are working with our interagency colleagues to review the over 10,000 comments that we received during the public comment period, and we are incorporating and modifying the final strategy as appropriate as much as we can. So that is where we are uh, working on that. And now Amy, my colleague, will uh, introduce herself and then talk more about the objectives next. Thanks, Lana, that's wonderful. Um, so I'm gonna go through the, the objectives of the strategy. And the first two objectives in the strategy are to prevent food loss and food waste. And so while we know that increasing the recycling of organic materials is critical, roughly 85% of greenhouse gas emissions from landfill food waste happen before the waste even gets to um, the disposal facility due to the resources that go into producing, distributing, and retailing that food. Um, so preventing is definitely why it's the most, that's why that's the most preferred approach. Um, and so the EPA actions for preventing food waste include developing, launching, and running a national consumer education and behavior change campaign. This will be a national customizable campaign. It will be informed by research on effective messaging for behavior change and learnings from community level food waste prevention campaigns that already exist. We are also looking to partner with the private sector to find upstream solutions to consumer food waste. We are going to research and identify unique drivers of food loss and waste um, that are unique to the United States and the incentives to reduce it. We will be investing in behavioral science to determine the most effective strategies to change household behaviors related to food waste. And we'll be testing new approaches in the US, um, identifying technological based solutions and facilitate sharing of best practices to reduce food loss and waste among retailers, manufacturers, food service providers, um, and including in their supply chains. So it doesn't matter if we um, try to reduce waste in the home, if all of the other industry and our other partners are still wasting a lot of food. Um, we're also going to be participating or continue to participate um, in international forums to share best practices, data, and tools. So that's all for preventing the loss and waste of food. So if we go to the next slide, yeah, thank you. Um, the third objective in the strategy is increasing the recycling rate for organics, because even when we make sure that food is eaten as much as possible, we're always going to be left with inedible scraps to manage. And so the fourth objective is to support policies that incentivize and encourage food loss and waste prevention and encourage organics recycling. 
So um, the, our actions at EPA to support these two objectives also include supporting the development of additional organics recycling infrastructure through grants and other technical assistance for communities, especially those that are underserved. Um, Lana is going to talk a little bit later about the solid waste infrastructure for recycling grants or what we call SWIFR, um, which are part of the bipartisan infrastructure law and they have a requirement that at least 40% of these funds go to underserved communities. We also are looking to expand the market for products made from recycled organic waste. And so expanding the market and increasing demand for compost and other soil amendments and other products arrived from wasted food can incentivize the recycling of food waste. And if you have all this, this material and nowhere for it to go. Um, so we're really looking um, to incentivize that as well. We're also hoping to enhance support for an, an advanced decentralized composting. So communities, scale and home composting, organics recycling. We are looking to build, refine and share tools and data to aid decision-making about infrastructure investments, waste management policies, waste management pathway destinations. Um, and so this includes promoting the new wasted food scale that the EPA just put out. Um, we're gonna be speaking about that a little bit later. Um, the development of a decision-making tool that may factor in a community's needs, goals and resources when considering options for food waste and food waste management. And we are interested in talking about addressing contamination in the organic waste recycling stream. So these are all actions that the EPA is, is looking to take as part of these two objectives. And so now that I've gone over, you know, what uh, our objectives are to the strategy, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of you who submitted comments on the strategy. Um, we understand that you don't often get a chance to dialogue with EPA directly. And so we appreciate the time that you took to send us such thoughtful, insightful comments. And even though the comment period is closed, um, for the strategy, you can, your, your input can still help us inform our work as we go forward. So the strategy is just one piece, you know, even if we don't address something directly in the strategy, that still informs the work that Juliana, Juliana and I and our teammates are working on. Um, so we have some questions for you today about what actions that could help the U.S. meet its goals that are not reflected in the draft strategies or what actions would result in more equitable outcomes that you see um, for underserved underserved and or food insecure communities. So um, one of my colleagues is gonna put these questions in the chat. And if you could resp respond in the chat, we will, um, we'll, we're gonna take a look at those <laughs> and, um, and make sure that we address them. So I'm gonna pause here for a little bit, but feel free to keep putting the responses as well as your own questions that you might have. And um, I'm gonna now turn it back over to Lana, who's gonna talk about current and future funding available at EPA. Thanks, Amy. All right, so again, as you're thinking, as I'm talking, you can certainly um, add any input into the chat that we can look at later. So um, Amy introduced it, but funding that we have for infrastructure and recycling. These are new programs that I'm going to talk about. So complementary to the strategy, I wanted to talk more about the new grant programs. Recycling organic waste, such as food scraps and yard trim, requires the appropriate infrastructure to be in place. EPA received historic amounts of funding through the bipartisan infrastructure law. And with that funding, we established two grant programs, the Solid Waste Infrastructure for Recycling Program, which we like to call SWIFR, and the Recycling Education and Outreach Program, which we call RIO. So I might use, uh, use those acronyms um, later. So both covered many aspects of materials management. They weren't specific to food. Again, uh, many aspects of material management were covered. And we received $350 million for both programs. Um, of the nearly 200 million that EPA awarded this past fall through these two grant programs, over 83 million went to projects that addressed organics recycling. And most of this went to composting projects, the majority of which included food waste. So I'm just gonna say that number again, because it's significant, 83 million of the 200 million that we awarded or selected the projects for and are in the process of awarding right now, um, 83 million of the nearly 200 million went to uh, addressing organics recycling, which is significant. Um, so I'm gonna move on a little bit and share some additional details about, about these new grant programs. 
We announced the selection of the first round of awards last fall. Uh, the Swiffer grants will fund a range of project types reflecting the range of infrastructure investment needs across this country, from planning and data selection to purchasing a new fleet of recycling collection vehicles and bins to constructing recycling drop-off stations and other infrastructure improvements. And there's some more details that are here on this slide about just over 32 million will be awarded to all eligible 50 states and six territories. That's a big deal too. Uh, 73 million will be awarded to 25 communities ranging from big cities to small rural communities nationwide. And over 60 million will go to 59 tribes across eight of the 10 EPA regions. And then our Rio grants, Recycling Education and Outreach, We'll fund education and outreach about recycling programs, and in some cases, include waste prevention aspects. Some of the, these projects also provide education to disadvantaged communities that have been traditionally underserved. Over $33 million of Rio funds will be awarded across all 10 EPA regions, specifically to 25 entities that include counties, cities, towns, nonprofit organizations, and public-private partnerships. So again, almost 200 million of the almost 200 million that EPA announced this fall through Swiffer and Rio, 83 million will support 72 projects that include activities related to organics recycling, composting, or anaerobic digestion. So EPA is now in the process of awarding. So we have the selection phase and now we are in the awarding phase, um, awarding the 59 competitive um, Swiffer tribal grants and the 25 competitive Swiffer grants for communities, as well as the 25 Rio grants. So now we're in that awarding phase right now. And I think, I think it's time for our first video break, Juliana. Thanks, Lana. Hi, everyone. I'm Juliana Beecher, and I'm um, excited to be here today. So I am going to introduce you briefly to um, one of our latest projects, which has been um, on community composting. And last year, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance helped us to develop a series of videos highlighting the environmental, social, and economic benefits of community, of community composting. And the videos are fun to watch and they're short, so we're gonna watch them throughout the presentation. And here is the first one highlighting the environmental benefits of community composting. Here we go. Reducing food waste is one of the most impactful actions we can take to tackle climate change, and composting is one way to reduce the amount of food going into the trash. EPA supports the reduction of food waste through training, education, and outreach, funding, and technical assistance. Through these videos, EPA hopes to help communities keep food out of landfills, build healthier soils, and improve local economies. Composting is magic. It takes food scraps and instead of letting them become pollutants or landfill waste, it transforms them into black gold, a resource that has endless soil benefits and actively combats climate change. The benefits of composting are even greater when wasted food is not sent far away using transportation that clogs our streets and air, but instead is done locally, keeping organic cycling in the same communities where the material is generated. With our community compost initiative, we use our solar powered trikes in order to collect food scraps, food waste from the community and return it back in the form of healthy greens and vegetables. It's all, you know, a closed loop. Communities thrive when they actively participate in the composting process. Local environmental benefits range from building nutrient-rich soils that grow more in healthier plants to reducing land, water, and air pollution. At any scale, composting reduces emissions and pollution, but it's community composting that can have the greatest impact on local ecosystem sustainability, climate resiliency, and environmental education. It turns out, when people get a chance to see firsthand the wonder of compost, they no longer see their food scraps as waste. It is definitely exciting, you know, learning about the microbes and the bacteria inside of the compost, how that benefits the plants is a world in itself. It's, it's amazing, like a wow moment, you know? 
You're like, ah, oh, I, I got to save everything that I'm throwing away. When kept local, composting not only builds healthy soils, but it also builds healthy, sustainable, resilient communities from the ground up. For more information, visit epa.gov slash composting. All right. Um, so next, I'm going to talk a little bit about recent EPA research on the impacts of food waste. So um, as a lot of you probably know, when we waste food, all the resources that go into producing, processing, transporting, retailing, and preparing it also go to waste. And disposal of food waste also has various impacts. The environmental impact of wasted food in the U.S. is substantial. It is equal to that of more than 50 million gas-powered vehicles or 60 coal-fired power plants and requires enough water and energy to supply more than 50 million homes each year. Since 2021, we've published several, several reports that provide data and analysis on the full footprint of wasted food from production through disposal, along with guidance on the most to least environment, environmentally preferable ways to manage it. So this past October, EPA released two related reports on the environmental impacts of wasted food. The first report modeled landfill methane emissions associated with food waste, and the second examined the environmental impacts of managing food waste through common pathways like landfilling, incineration, composting, anaerobic digestion, and sending food down the drain through the sewer system and wastewater treatment. And both reports are available on EPA's website. Looking first at our landfill methane study, when organic waste, such as wasted food, breaks down in landfills under anaerobic conditions, methane is generated, and some of that methane is emitted to the atmosphere. Methane traps 28 times more heat than carbon dioxide over a 100-year period, and about 80 times more over a 20-year period. So reducing methane emissions is of utmost importance in tackling climate change. We undertook this study because we knew a few things, such as municipal solid waste landfills are the third largest source of methane emissions from human activities in the U.S., and food waste comprises 20 to 25 percent of MSW landfilled in the, in the U.S. But we didn't know what proportion of landfill methane emissions are due to food waste. Most estimate, estimates of landfill methane emissions from food are calculated based on the biodegradation of municipal solid waste as a whole, but different types of waste behave differently in landfills, and successful emissions reduction strategies may depend on understanding the source of those emissions. And so to model methane emissions from food waste in landfills, in food waste specifically in landfills, we relied on existing widely used EPA models and data sources like the GHG inventory, the GHG greenhouse gas reporting program, and the WARM and LANGEM models. And I'll touch more on WARM later. Um, and we considered the mix of current landfill characteristics in the U.S. So what did we learn? Food waste decomposing in landfills has an out outsized impact on landfill emissions. In 2020, an estimated 58% of the fugitive methane emissions from MSW landfills were from landfilled food waste. Equally important, we found that looking over time, while total landfill methane emissions are decreasing, food waste landfill emissions are increasing. The figure here shows total MSW, MSW landfill methane emissions from 1990 to 2020, with the portion attributable to food waste highlighted in red. Improvements in landfill gas capture systems have decreased overall landfill methane emissions, but since food waste decays more quickly than many other organic wastes, such as paper, substantial emissions occur before these landfill gas capture systems are in place. So in 2020, an estimated 61% of methane generated by landfills, landfilled food waste was not captured by the landfill gas collection systems. And in addition, unlike some other organic wastes, the absolute amount of food waste being landfilled each, each year is increasing. So what these findings really highlight is the need to do everything we can to divert food from landfills. 
And this can be accomplished in many ways. Um, and of course, preventing food waste from being generated in the first place has the most environmental benefits, as Amy mentioned, due to all of the resources it takes to produce food. But of course, there is a need for other options too, um, such as composting and anaerobic digestion. So now I wanna to turn to our second report that we published in October. EPA began research on the environmental impacts of wasted food from farm to consumer in a 2021 report and continued that analysis by evaluating the environmental impacts of 11 common wasted food management pathways in our latest report, From Field to Bin. So this is, part, this is the second part in this series of reports that is looking at the full impact of food waste. And um, with the second report, we had the intention of updating or confirming the food recovery hierarchy based on the results. And some of you um, may remember the food recovery hierarchy. It was released in the 1990s and the environmental impacts of food waste have been studied much more since then especially the contributions of wasted food to GHG emissions and climate change. And also the technologies and operational practices have changed in some cases and wasted food is being managed in ways that were not included in the previous hierarchy, such as upcycling, land application, sending food down the drain and leaving it unharvested in the field. And in recent years, EPA's sustainable materials management work has shifted to focus on building a circular economy for all, which ties into um, the recycling strategies that Lana discussed. Um, and just a reminder about a circular economy is it's one that reduces material use, redesigns materials to be less resource intensive and recaptures waste, in quotes, as a resource to manufacture new materials and products. Oops. Um, and so, I'm sorry, here we go. Um, okay, back on track. So basically the goal of a circular economy is to decouple economic growth from resource extraction by capturing greater value from existing products and materials. And this contrasts with the traditional linear take, make, use, dispose economy. Um, so, in response to, so in response to changes in these materials management priorities and advances in technologies and the urgency of addressing climate change, and also in response to calls for a new hierarchy from our partners, EPA undertook an analysis of the environmental impacts of wasted food and management pathways, which are documented in two reports, um, and which ultimately culminated in the new wasted food scale, which you just got a little preview of. Um, so quickly, I just want to give a note on definitions. Upcycling in EPA's analysis refers to using food scraps and parts of food ingredients to make new food products, such as using spent grains from the brewing process to make flour and snack bars. And then land application refers to spreading, spraying, or injecting raw wasted food on or below the surface of the soil, which is a practice that can be used by food manufacturers and processors. And land application does not refer to applying compost or digestate to the soil. The sewer and wastewater slash wastewater treatment pathway refers to sending food down the drain through the sewer system to a water resource recovery facility or wastewater treatment plant where it may or may not end up being anaerobically digested. If food waste is being trucked to a water resource recovery facility to be anaerobically digested, then that would be considered the anaerobic digestion pathway since that food did not go through the sewer system to get to the wastewater treatment plant. And while we chose uh, the 11 pathways that you see on this slide for analysis, we did not include every possible food waste management method. There are several emerging pathways that are not common or at commercial scale. And there were also pathways for which there was not enough data to do analysis. So here's the wasted food scale, um, which hopefully you have seen before. Um, so the wasted food scale ranks wasted food pathways from most to least environmentally preferable, with the most preferable being the darkest green. And this replaces EPA's food recovery hierarchy. Um, the wasted food scale is available in eight languages. 
Uh, there's a simple version and a detailed version that has a little more um, description of each pathway. And you can find all of the files on our website for download. The scale is based specifically on the environmental performance of wasted food in the pathways and is not applicable to other types of waste. Um, and also social and economic factors were not considered in the, in the analysis, so purely um, focused on environmental impacts. And pathways are grouped into tiers where EPA determined them to have equivalent performance. Um, so very briefly, I just want to touch on the broad findings of this report that then led to the wasted food scale. Source reduction, donation, and upcycling are the most environmentally preferable pathways because they can displace additional food production. And the benefits of pathways beyond source reduction, donation, and upcycling are small relative to the environmental impacts of food production. Thus, they can do little to offset those environmental impacts. Sewer slash wastewater treatment for sending food down the drain and landfilling stand out for their sizable methane emissions. And these two pathways along with incineration are to be avoided if possible. Recycling wasted food into soil amendments through composting and anaerobic digestion offers opportunities to make long-term improvements in soil structure and health and help regenerate ecosystems by recovering nitrogen and carbon and returning them to the soil. And two things I wanna note that are new about this scale. First, the AD ranking is dependent on whether digestator biosolids are beneficially used or are disposed of. And second, composting is now ranked equally to AD when the AD process beneficially uses digestate. And this is due to the well-researched benefits of applying organic soil amendments, um, which most of you probably know, um, and which are strongest for compost. However, AD also produces energy, and so those two pathways are ranked equally. Um, and just a note that if, for example, digested or biosolids are composted um, prior to being used beneficially, then those that would be considered under AD with beneficial use. And finally, I want to note that the US, as the US becomes less dependent on fossil fuels for energy, the environmental value of producing energy from wasted food through AD, incineration, and landfilling will decrease. Okay, so just a glimpse of what's next for our food waste research. Um, a report is coming out on the value of compost use with a focus specifically on non-agricultural uses, such as in landscaping, stormwater management, and site restoration and remediation. And that report will be out later this year. And then these other projects are in earlier stages, but we're going to look at barriers to expanding compost use, especially in non-agricultural sectors, and barriers to increasing composting of food waste specifically. Um, there we go. My mouse is being rather touchy, I apologize. And um, then we're also going to look at methane emissions from food sent down the drain. We know from previous research that there are significant fugitive methane emissions from the sewer system, but we don't know how much of those are attributable to food specifically. And finally, we're going to update three reports that came out in 2021 on food waste pre-processing technologies, PFAS, and plastics contamination. So this is a series on sort of emerging issues um, in food waste management, and we are updating all three reports because a lot has happened on those three topics since 2021. Okay, so now some more questions for you, and I'll hand it back to Amy. Thanks, Juliana. That was a lot of wonderful information. So now that you have a, you know, a taste of all of the research that EPA is doing currently or has plans to do in the future, we'd like to hear from you about what um, previous or planned research you're most interested in and what additional research um, you might be interested uh, or that the EPA should be doing <laughs> um, that you think is maybe missing from, from that you know, buffet that we just kind of laid out for you. So again, we're going to pause for just a few seconds. Um, Lana has very helpfully put the questions in the chat. 
And thank you for all your responses um, to the last question. We, we have not forgotten about you and we will review those at the end. And we're gonna go to another video break. If Juliana could share the video. This video um, is was similar to the, the previous one, but it is about the social benefits of community composting. The composting process brings living things together, big and small, from microbes to worms to humans. Community composting encourages people to get engaged through events, trainings, volunteer days, and more, connecting people with their environment, their food system, and one another. It also promotes food security, creates inclusive gathering spaces, and provides a whole host of other social benefits. Youth of color especially have a lot of anxiety around the impacts of climate change. It will be a problem we can't escape. You're just sitting there powerless in a way thinking, I can't really do anything about the situation, it's out of my hands. And I think this work physically puts the power back into the hands of young people. In overburdened and underserved communities, community composting and local compost use can work to mitigate the impacts of disinvestment and environmental injustice. We are the bridge for this community that's located in a food insecure, food apartheid neighborhood where it takes about an hour to get to a market. Filbert Street Garden was created to give residents that lived in a concrete jungle an opportunity to be able to grow their food. We're also in one of the most toxic areas in Baltimore City uh, where we have two incinerators. So we're diverting that material from being burnt or buried. So our goal here is to feed the soil and feed the community. Composting locally strengthens, educates, and empowers the people involved. In rebuilding our soils, we also work to rebuild our communities. Through training and education, funding opportunities, policies, and programs, EPA supports communities in meeting their goals and needs associated with reducing the harmful impacts of food waste. For more information, visit epa.gov composting. Okay, so this is the final section of our presentation. Um, we uh, wanted to go over some of the tools and resources that we have available for your use. Um, and so I'm going to touch quickly on three tools um, and then we'll go into de more detail on some others. So first up, EPA's waste reduction model or WARM provides high-level comparisons of potential greenhouse gas emissions reductions, energy savings, and economic impacts when considering different materials management practices. 60 materials are modeled, including food and other kinds of organics. And um, this past December, EPA opened a comment period on WARM version 16 and its supporting documentation. That comment period closed in March. Um, and since WARM launched in 1998, EPA has updated WARM many times to expand its coverage of material types, management pathways, and impact indicators, while incorporating new and improved data in the model. Next, in 2023, we launched a searchable database of local and state government climate action plans that include measures to address materials management and waste, and you can search by topic or state to find plans that cover your interests. And we also have a model recycling program toolkit, which is also searchable and contains dozens of resources. Um, for instance, you can find our managing and transforming waste streams tool in um, that model recycling program toolkit. Um, so then the Access Food Opportunities Map is another one of our tools. And it's a national resource to support and facilitate the connection between potential sources and potential users of excess food so we can put food to better use. And the map was first published in 2018 and is updated every two to three years. The current version launched in July of last year, 2023. And the map's underlying data come from publicly and commercially available data sets 
a few of which we maintain here at EPA. Um, and the map shows the location and basic information for potential generators and recipients of excess food, as well as excess food estimates for each generator. And the excess food generators include educational institutions, grocery stores, healthcare facilities, restaurants, food manufacturers, hotels, farmers markets, and others. Potential recipients include composting facilities, anaerobic digesters, and food banks. Um, and food banks are actually also considered a generator of wasted food. Um, and though the focus of the map is on food, we do map composting and AD facilities that do not accept food waste in order to more comprehensively describe organics recycling infrastructure in the US. And those are two of the data sets that we maintain at EPA. We also map infrastructure that supports excess food management, including refriger refrigerated warehousing and storage and communities with source separated organics programs. Um, additional map layers are imported from EPA's Environmental Justice Screening Tool and USDA's Food Environment Atlas. And with these additional layers, the map allows users to overlay potential sources of excess food with areas where monetary means, nutritional gaps, physical distance, or lack of transportation may prevent people from obtaining food. So it provides a little more context, basically. And the map will see a minor update this summer which will include a much larger data set of food banks, food pantries, and soup kitchens, plus more standalone and on-farm AD facilities and farmers markets. The map has a technical methodology and a user guide to support its use, and all of the underlying data sets are available for download. So now I will turn it back over to Amy to talk about some more tools. Thanks, Juliana. And I'm just monitoring the chat and I see that a lot of people are excited about behavior change research. So I am so excited to talk to you about this next section. <laughs> um, so in addition to maps and calculators, which are those quantitative tools that Juliana just went over, EPA also has some resources that are specifically geared towards municipalities and communities that have maybe a little bit more qualitative research um, and behavior change research. So these toolkits um, are, there's two of them and they both intend to move your community from awareness about wasted food and composting towards towards action to prevent wasted food and composting what remains. And they work by providing guidance on developing a social marketing campaign and customizable materials that will spur behavior change. So these toolkits are designed for use by states, territories, local governments, tribes, and NGOs. And they, um, why do we do this? You know, and as we talked about, um, is and is illustrated in the key strategies for mitigating methane emissions from municipal solid waste. The number one municipal solid waste methane emissions mitigation strategy is to prevent food waste. And the second is type to divert organic waste. And oftentimes we found that governments design programs as awareness campaigns and that ex they expect that to kind of drive behavior change. But, you know, we know, and maybe you know as well, that we tell people that up to 40% of food is wasted or that food waste is responsible for up to 10% of greenhouse gas emissions globally. Um, but making people aware of the issue, it's an important first step. It, on its own, it doesn't really um, drive behavior change. I find often I tell people that 40% of food is wasted and then I ask them how much they waste and they're like, oh, not that much. But I mean, we know that, that people waste that much. Um, so really understanding to, to the behavior change research is that we need to understand what barriers are in place from preventing people from doing the behavior we want them to do. We need to understand the benefits and motivators associated with those behaviors. And we need to understand the question of what's in it for them to change their behavior. And if the benefits and motivators outweigh the barriers, people will change their behaviors. So for an example, um, for the prevention of food waste is we want the desired behavior is to properly store your fruits and vegetables so they stay fresher longer and you don't you know, dispose of them improperly. The barrier is the lack of knowledge about how to properly store these vegetables. Um, the benefit of proper storage is that you manage your household more efficiently and the motivator is you save money by wasting less food. So um, we came up with these toolkits by interviewing many different organizations and we found that the number one issue that organizations and communities and municipalities run into is they don't have enough resources to um, actually create a behavior change campaign on their own. So each of these toolkits um, comes with a step-by-step -step guide to kind of think through what is needed in your community. Um, and then they also, we've also 
did some testing where we um, pulled some of the greater, you know, more common messages and more attractive uh, materials, and we've made them available for you to download. The communities shared them with us, and they are available to download and customize to be to put your community's name on there or make them more applicable to your community. Um, so, so you can go to the EPA website and download both the toolkit and also these customizable, what we're calling collateral. So it's like posters, social media posts, and radio ads and things like that. Um, so there's five sets for the prevention campaign, five sets of materials, and four sets for the composting campaign. So there's lots of um, wonderful things on there um, if you're interested. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Thanks. So the other, um, the other thing that we do um, in addition to providing these materials, we also facilitate two peer networks that are primarily targeted to state and local government staff. The first one is the Food Too Good to Waste peer network, which is a network of mostly state and local government staff and the non-government organizations that they collaborate with. And these, these organizations who work on various food waste prevention programs with a focus on households and consumers. This group meets monthly and they hear presentations from governments working on household food waste prevention, researchers studying behavioral science interventions on at-home food, on home food waste prevention and reduction, um, EPA grant awardees and other grant awardees whose work focuses on the issue of wasted food and, and more. Um, this group is not limited to domestic practitioners. We've had international practitioners come and present to us in the past um, and the international campaigns featured as well. We also have the National Compost and Anaerobic Digestion Peer Network, and that is comprised of EPA and state and local government staff working on composting and AD. And this group meets quarterly, um, and they have a Microsoft Teams channel for presentations and discussion and information sharing. And members of this group are encouraged to reach out with suggestions on topics of highest interest, and they can volunteer to lead a discussion. So um, if you have some exciting things to share with this group, feel free to reach out to us, and we can see if you can be put on the agenda. And the presentations can be internal or external, so depending on the topics and who best resources are. And I'd like to say that the same for the Food Too Good to Waste Network as well. So if you have some ideas about um, of presentations for that, we're always looking for, for presenters there. Um, so I'm going to hand it back over to Juliana so she can speak more about our work in the anaerobic digestion space, specifically on how we collect data and how we share that data as well. Thanks, Amy. So EPA's anaerobic digestion data collection project um, began in response to a need for more data on, on the AD industry in general, and specific, more specifically on AD capacity to process food waste in the US. Data collection began around 2017 with surveys sent to AD facilities that process food waste, including standalone digesters and farms and water resource recovery facilities with co-digestion systems. And in the next few weeks, we will publish aggregated data from the most recent round of surveys in 20, which took place in 2023 and which collected data from 2020 and 2021. Um, so we're a couple of years behind, but that's normal with this kind of survey, I think. Um, and we will also soon begin the sixth round of surveys for AD facilities uh, in which we will gather data for 2022 and 2023, and we'll get a bit more caught up. So the same data types will be collected as in previous surveys in this next round. And those include quantities, types, and sources of food and non-food feedstock processed, biogas production, digestate use, operational dates, and more. And these AD surveys help us identify digesters that process food waste for inclusion in the excess food opportunities map. And the data are also used in EPA's wasted food reports, which are an annual measurement of, of wasted food in the US, and also EPA's greenhouse gas inventory and our food waste research and other EPA projects, as well as by external partners. And now I'll hand it back to Lana, to finish us off. Thank you. The last resource to share is our updated composting web pages. We worked really hard on these uh, to get a lot more content and resources um, in one place. So they include the content on community composting and the videos that we've been sharing and watching during this presentation. We also updated the rest of our composting web pages in the past fall uh, with more links and content on different approaches to composting and how to get started with composting at home. So check it out. And 
our last question for you to think about. What additional tools or resources would be helpful for you, your organization or your community to reduce wasted food? So one more question to think about as we go to our final video break. And I don't know about everyone else, but I really, really like these videos. We're very proud of them and they always give me a warm feeling um, at the end. So I hope you enjoy the final one. And again, they're all available on our website. This one is on economic benefits of community composting. When you think of community composting, what do you picture? Sure, it can look like small urban gardens, but community composters are also farmers, using their finished compost product to increase crop yields and farm income. And there are small businesses, handling large quantities of food scraps while creating local jobs at a higher rate per ton compared to landfills and incinerators. When people compost with BK Rot, they're really looking at putting their dollars back into their neighbors and putting them back into their communities right where they are. They're also getting a greater amount of like personal connection to that investment. We have a really strong team. And it's a pretty sweet gig knowing that we're collecting food scraps and helping the environment. There's no one model for what community composting looks like, which is why all across the country, composters are thriving. And because they're flexible, innovative, and attuned to the needs of their communities, they do all of this while requiring less money and startup time than more centralized, large industrial facilities. We were the first company to offer food scraps collections here in our community. Our end goal was always to partner with the city. We want to strategically invest our dollars to create a robust composting organics recycling program that will have long-term benefits for years to come. When you couple the local economic benefits of community composting with the social and environmental benefits that come with local compost use, the savings start to really add up. Investing in local composting supports small enterprises and nonprofits that are sensitive to community needs. Growing a resilient economy, local, circular, and diverse, like community composting itself. Through training and education, funding opportunities, policies, and programs, EPA supports communities in meeting their goals and needs associated with reducing the harmful impacts of food waste. For more information, visit epa.gov composting. Great. I hope you enjoyed that last video. Um, all of the resources that we presented on today and more are on our EPA web pages. And the QR code on this um, slide will take you to the sign up page for our newsletter. And the links on this slide may also be of interest. So thank you so much for joining us during this presentation. I especially want to thank Juliana and Amy for pulling all of this material together so we can share it with you today. So a big thanks and round of applause for them. And we're happy to answer any questions and continue our discussion this morning. Great. Thank you all so much. And just a quick reminder that I will be posting live links, hot links, to all of the resources shared when I post this recording. And so if you didn't get your screen grab in or whatever, um, we, you will have, we'll be providing those um, again with the recording of this webinar and the slide deck. Um, so thank you all for all of this information. I know there's three of you and you've been kind of responding to some things in chat. Do you want me to go ahead and read through chat or do you wanna take over that piece and, and, and pull some out, whatever works best for you all. Natasha, if you notice mm -hmm. any questions, I mean, I know sure. I'm, I want to thank all the participants and um, mm -hmm. for providing input to us. Again, that helps inform our work. Um, and we are always interested in external input. We don't like to work, you know, the three of us can't figure this all out by ourselves. We've got, we need help. So I uh, really appreciate all the comments and in response to our questions. Um, if you see any particularly interesting sure. questions, feel free to, 
to bring them to our attention. Um, but I do see lots of input. And again, thank you to everyone. Yeah, so I'll start going through those. But um, while I do that, I'm going to invite Heather Trim to um, go ahead and unmute. And if you'd like, share your video. If not, that's fine. And um, get us started. We can have some, we're a small enough group, I think, to have some dynamic interaction as well, as opposed to me just reading from the chat. But I will look through and pull some things out. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Heather Trim, Executive Director of Zero Waste Washington out in Seattle. So this is drawing from the entire country. Um, thank you for your presentation. Very excited that, that EPA is taking leadership on all this. Um, my question is about compostable packaging. You kind of didn't ever mention it in your entire presentation. So I'm wondering what you all are doing about that topic. Well, it is certainly a hot topic. Um, I mentioned very briefly that it is um, in our plastic strategy, which is also draft and we're working to finalize it. Just recognizing that that is an issue, compostable packaging, compostable, you know, making sure that it's certified compostable. Um, we are very aware of the time limit that that is or is not on a lot of packaging. Um, we're aware of uh, the confusion and perhaps greenwashing of some products that are made available to the public. And I mean, I can use examples of my own family that want to buy products because they have a cute little leaf or something on them and they think that they're environmental, but we know um, who work on these issues all the time that if those products may or may not be 100% uh, compostable, um, may not go back to um, the basic components of soil and may end up just being contamination. Um, so we are aware of this issue. Um, Juliana mentioned that we have some white papers from our Office of Research and Development and they're going to update some of those um, papers related um, to this topic specifically. So being aware of the, of the topic, participating in groups like this, uh, participating with US Composting Council to just know that this is a hot topic and, and being aware of the issue, updating our research, finding those gaps and being able to work with state and local municipalities um, to know what those issues are um, and see where that might lead our work. But I can I can also ask Juliana or Amy if you want to add anything else. Um, I would I would say that uh, that's exactly right, Lana. That um, these upcoming updates to um, those emerging issues papers are probably going to go much more in depth on compostable plastics than. Um, than we have elsewhere so far, if that makes sense. So we're we're sort of trying to figure out, you know, follow follow the research, and a lot of a lot of it has come out of uh, the state of Vermont, which is great. Um, and we've been really excited by all of all of the work that's happening there. So stay tuned for more soon. Great, thank you so much. I'm gonna um, actually jump to a couple just more um, connection questions that we had. One is. Um, where folks can sign up to be notified when new EPA reports are released. And I'm wondering if that might be that newsletter with a QR code you provided. Is that, that the is best correct. way? If you, yeah. If you so, sign up for In the Loop, we will, we try to push all of that new um, information out on a monthly basis. Great. So that's, we'll be, we'll be providing links to do that and that QR code as well. Um, if you didn't grab it, um, if you want, if you can't wait, I'm sure you can reach out to our presenters or to me and we can get that to you before, um, be likely before I get the recording posted. The other question um, that was partially answered was whether the peer networks were um, open to the public. And I saw a, an email provided that one of you provided in chat for people who want to be added to that, but it was still not clear is that is, is anyone who sends you an email uh, uh, able to join those groups or are they for specific types of, you know, for, for municipalities or, or other? They are really targeted for state and to create this uh, space for state and local governments. Occasionally we'll pull in someone else that is working with the state or local government, but those peer networks are, are intended for state and local government representatives. Um, so that they can share uh, with their peers. So they're not public meetings. They're not open for all. If you're interested, if you want to present something to this particular group, 
I would encourage you to contact our SMM food at epa.gov mailbox. There's a, a team of people that look at that, which is a little safer. Um, and you might get a more prompt response than trying to uh, try to contact me individually. That might There might be a delay, but of course we'll all get back to you as soon as possible. So they're, they're not public, they're not posted. Um, it is intended for state and local governments to create that network for them as they work through a variety of issues. Um, but if you are interested, contact us and we'll see if it makes sense for you to join or communicate with that group. Great. Thank you so much for that clarification. And we'll be sure to put that email um, for folks of you who might fit into that category, who might be interested in presenting in the notes from this session as well. Um, we had a, a number of questions come in about ways to engage with multi-unit housing um, and, and other uh, sort of harder to reach or, or, or groups of individuals that uh, have perhaps some different, a different set of barriers than single household residents um, or even schools. And so I just wondered if you wanted to touch on if you're if you're thinking about some of those other groups in terms of the the, the full suite that you've talked about the food waste reduction um, and or you know organics recycling. I mean, we do want to think about how we reach people um, where they are and uh, different sectors, um, young and old, different parts inside the you know urban or rural. So we are trying to think about how to reach people and uh, have the best rate of success. And working for I've been working for EPA for over twenty years, and multi-family housing has always been an issue. Before I started working on food, when it was just even just traditional recycling, that is just a hard, a hard um, area to work through. Um, I think there are some successful examples out there. Um, but it is certainly something that we are also trying to think about. How do we reach people? And like Amy talked about, the getting the desired behavior change, um, thinking through what makes it easy for people, what's the barrier for them. So that sector, multifamily housing, um, is certainly one of those sectors that we're thinking about. How can we reach successfully? How can we be successful in that area too? But Amy, if you want to add anything, feel free. Yeah, I just put a resource in the chat from the Illinois Food Scrap and Composting Coalition. So they've been working on this um, a little bit. And every place is different. So it really does depend on your, you know, your region or your county or your municipality. Um, but I think it also just depends on, um, you know, what the priorities of your state are and, and how they, like how people just live, you know, <laughs> like do people live mostly in single family homes? They live like in a more urban or a rural area. So there's all sorts of different considerations. Um, oh, New York city. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I don't think this is like a comprehensive, but I mean, it's just a way to start thinking about it. Um, and you'll know best about your own community. And, and that's why these toolkits that we've created are, can be adapted to each community. So we have you kind of walk through the steps of what's happening in your community currently, um, you know, what do people care about in your community? Like, how can you kind of um, uh, like uh, connect habits that they're already doing or, you know, kind of work on habit stacking so that we can kind of like, you know, have it be uh, a force multiplier there. So um, yeah, we, we understand that this is a concern for people who live in dense urban areas that may not have access to these kinds of resources. Great, thank you so much. And I think um, part of the challenge around renters as well is likely tied, you know, uh, addressed in some of those resources. And we also had some questions about schools and engaging with schools um, twofold. One is if you have, um, you know, either education or curricula kind of support that can get into schools and be shared with schools. And then also, is there any funding for schools who want to set up diversion programs and do waste audits and potentially also do on uh, on site composting, establish on site composting at the school property itself? I'm not aware of any specific funding through EPA 
for schools specifically, our funding, like I talked about, the bipartisan infrastructure law, new grant programs, those are going to state and local governments, which could be distributed um, even more um, into smaller uh, chunks of money um, as the state wants to distribute them. Um, so that's a possibility. Um, we do have a new resource page for uh, schools, um, and that's something we've been wanting to do for a long time. So we've tried, again, to put, just like our new composting page, we have a new um, educational like resources uh, targeted for schools. So we have some information. And then also, I just wanted to remind everyone that EPA, we're working at the headquarters level, we have 10 EPA regions, but we delegate a lot of that authority to, to the states on how specific things are managed or how materials are managed. So I just wanted to repeat that because as much as I want to work in my local community, I'm, I'm at a different level. So we can provide these resources, we can make connections, we can provide data and reports, and that can all help us. Um, at, the, at different levels, state, local, um, and different sectors. Great, thank you. And I see some uh, links to resources being shared. So thank you all for dropping those in and we'll be pulling those out again. For folks um, listening in, you can certainly click on those. They should be live and active from the chat box, but if you miss them um, or if you open them and then they get closed again, we will be including all of those with the recording. Um, we also have a question asking if you could speak a little bit more about how you will be working with USDA to engage more with farmers and rural communities about composting. Wow, we are working very closely with USDA in the development of this strategy. I mean, we announced the food loss and waste reduction goal um, in 2015 jointly with USDA. So they have been a partner with us even before that, but I mean, our team must meet with representatives from USDA weekly, more than weekly. So we definitely have a connection to the Food Loss and Waste Liaison there. Um, and we have a new Office of uh, Agriculture at EPA too, who also works with USDA. So through the development of our strategy, which is a joint product, USDA, EPA, and FDA, we are working to on many different efforts and USDA has a lot of uh, their authorities around food loss and getting food from reducing the amount of loss between the field and the retail space. Um, and they certainly have a lot more engagement and opportunity to engage with farmers. But our work with USDA, our new agricultural office and liaison with USDA are all areas that we are using to reduce food loss and waste and be able to connect with the agricultural sector. Great, thank you. And um, let me see if there's, great. And Chris uh, Bailing, thank you for, for dropping in some, some links as well. Um, does anyone wanna unmute and ask a question? Yeah, Morgan, go ahead. Hi, um, so I did drop my question in the chat as well, um, but it was just regarding if the EPA has any influence or plan to evaluate local municip municipality flow controls that are in place, um, which are kind of a barrier to, you know, small businesses or more local composting programs. Okay, I now I just have to think about flow control. Um, I'm not familiar with that term, but some of the evaluation we are doing are with our grantees. So we are giving money to different municipalities and part of the responsibility of giving out federal money to various municipalities, communities, state and local governments is to summarize that project and what they're doing and evaluate the success, you know, because we have to answer to um, those who appropriated the money for, to us and be able to show that it was worth um, funding various projects. You know, what did we get out of, out of that distribution of funds? So there is evaluation in our grantee projects, 
um, to make sure that that was worth federal investment, for example. Absolutely. Um, so just to reference uh, flow control specifically, it might be uh, more specific to New Jersey, um, but it just references local municipalities have the ability to put in um, basically amendments that say local um, you know, schools, small businesses, the public um, do you have to bring certain types of waste to their local government's landfills. Um, so they're not allowed to distribute that to other places, which kind of can prevent it from getting to those compost facilities to an extent. Um, and there's actually a list on the Atlantic County uh, website in New Jersey that just talks about the different flow controls for, for the counties. Okay, well, that sounds like an issue that I'd have to defer to my state counterparts. Um, and that's something that we're looking at specifically at e from EPA at the federal level. Okay, thank you. Great, thanks. Um, we have uh, from chat again, we have a, a question about whether um, there are any apps that EPA is considering developing. The one um, from Allison was specifically suggesting a, an app for people to track how much food they are wasting and somehow tying it to the associated cost that they are wasting, or the, the money that they are wasting with that. Um, and I know that a bunch of different kinds of apps for all, exist already for connecting, um, you know, like food, food excess with food, you know, with, with where that food is needed. But I wonder if you all are working anything on the this waste aspect. I haven't seen anything like that. I am not aware of any app development, but I love that. I love that idea, and I do know that there are a lot of things out there already. Um, no, I can't. I mean, USDA's Food Keeper app is the only like related app that I'm aware of, like a federal app, but I don't think it gets to that waste cost. Um, but that's a great idea. And can you tell people about that Food Keeper app? Oh, the Food Keeper app? Ooh, off the top of my head. So that is, uh, you can put in a specific product and it will give you advice on how long to keep it and, and the proper storage for it, um, I think is the overall. Um, yeah, that's my family. So it's sure. it's basically how to, it's the, it gets at that storage waste storage. connection in terms of mm -hmm. like, you know, my avocados are all, you know, they're all hard and then they all ripen at the same time. What do I do? That's a, that may not be in there, but, um, but, but that kind of storage or ex life extension of life extension of the, the food that you've purchased. Um, let's just see here. And if folks would, um, well, let's see, Cody is just saying, um, I think if an app was developed focused on positive reinforcement of behavior change through cost saving rather than money wasted through wasted food, that might be a beneficial angle. So for any of you out there who might be app development savvy, I know more and more people are just like, oh, I'll just make an app for that. And that is fair, you know, just uh, I'll admit but beyond my technical capabilities. But I really like that idea as well of like, how do we utilize, um, how do we leverage some of the technology that many of us are using today to support positive behavior change? And there were a lot of comments you addressed um, some of the behavior change and the, the social marketing aspects. And it's really exciting. I'm looking forward to digging into some of the resources that, that EPA has developed. But that's, you know, that's something that we've talked about a lot at other summits and that, you know, certainly comes around of like, how do, how do we crack that nut? How do we, how do we uh, move people from awareness to action, as you said? And, um, and uh, if anyone else wants to chime in on that specifically, I wasn't going to, you know, uh, in the chat, there were a lot of comments that we, we need that. Um, but I feel like you've, you did provide some tangible links to those resources. But if you'd like to expand on that, or if anyone in any of the participants would like to ask specific questions, please raise your hand or, or just go ahead and unmute. Um, and if you can't find the hand raising function in Zoom, if you just turn your camera on um, or unmute, that's a, we can see that and you'll pop right up. And so that's another way that, that we, can, um, we can invite you to, to uh, share. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, 
Uh, so one comment is that EPA's informational one, pap one papers, graphics and charts are very helpful for communicating the importance of composting and food waste reduction in a way that people can absorb. More of those are always helpful. So um, just in case you weren't sure if folks were actually utilizing those, those are a popular tool, more please. Um, in, as well as replicable case studies. Um, Shannon says she'd love to learn from specific success stories um, or instances where campaigns drove behavior change. And, and I have not had a chance to really dig into all of the behavior change tools and, and resources that, that you shared today, but if there, I don't know, I don't, if you wanna address that, are there examples where, you know, of, of success stories that people can draw inspiration from as part of that material? Answer this. So we are, um, we are, we just released these toolkits last year. So um, in the Food Too Good to Waste Peer Network, we are going to be speaking soon with people who've used them or downloaded them and seen if there's been success. Like I mentioned, a lot of times um, what happens in these communities is they don't have a budget to evaluate properly. So we are speaking with people, a lot of times people will just evaluate um, things by social media clicks or likes or shares and not necessarily connect that back to, you know, waste audits and things like that, um, that can be more accurate. Um, so we are still working on this. Um, I think that it's, we're going to learn a lot more in the, in the coming months and years as people continue to download this material, um, and let us know how it goes. You know, if we're hoping that because we're able to offer these these materials, um, for free or customizable, you know, to be customized that, then people can spend their money to actually evaluate and um, and work on them themselves and kind of evaluate what works best for their community. So if we can get you halfway there and you meet us halfway um, with the evaluation piece, we'd love to hear uh, how that's working out. And, and we also are interested in hearing from communities that have had successful partnerships with universities and things like that, that may have that kind of budget for that kind of evaluation as well. So stay tuned. And, I'll, <laughs> like yeah, and, and I'll just quickly add that um, a couple of years ago at one of the Vermont summits, we did have a, a deep dive on behavior change and, and uh, community-based social marketing. And I can drop a link to the recording of that as well. But there were some examples of, at least at the front end, of getting people to even um, a, a start diverting food scraps. And so it was more on the composting side of things and the, you know, distributing kitchen caddies and, and getting people to sign up for, for compost services, not so much on the waste, but they did share some, um, some success stories and as part of that as well. I think that was 2022, but I'll, I'll look that link up. Um, one, another, uh, comment that was put into chat by Allison was that it would be great to develop a resource for people who are disposing of working refrigerators in, a, in an attempt to have them donated to community refrigerator programs or to develop such a program. And that sounds to me more community-based specific than um, a national program, but that's just my little Vermont um, perception perhaps. So I don't know if you all are aware of, um, I know in Vermont, we, there's a number of um, little free pantries as well as some that have refrigerators that are maintained by communities to essentially provide access to excess food that's donated or recovered. Um, but I don't know if you all wanna comment on that idea or have your own perspe perspectives on that. Well, just that that is an interesting thought. We know that refrigeration is needed and that's sometimes a barrier to get food from an event to some place that can hold it and then distribute it because they don't have the proper storage so that um, Juliana mentioned that that's a new layer, one of the newer layers in our access food opportunities map, the, the cold storage. Um, but thinking about perfectly good working refrigerators, how do we build that network and make sure that those appliances, just because I didn't want the stainless steel cover, color in my kitchen, mm -hmm. but it's still perfectly good, it could go to some place that could really use it and it could help get food to people who can, who really need it. So great idea. Um, and so we can encourage that uh, reuse and we are trying to do that part of our circular economy effort, um, not just 
recycling, but also reusing a usable materials and appliances are one of those things that could be easily, especially if they're in perfectly good working order. Um, it's an example of something that could easily be reused um, within your own community. Boy, it would be exciting if we had national data on this, right? Like, I mean, I, I just, I'm not sure if we're there, but um, uh, great. So um, one more uh, question specifically about anaerobic digestion. Um, where has AD been most successful? What about the increasing concern about toxins or PFAS in biosolids? Uh, and then they just added, sounds like you're already planning to study, but it's an increasing concern. And have you already identified problematic sites? Okay, that's a lot of questions that's, in a row. That Juliana, is, I'll let you, I'll let you <laughs> um, address any of those, Juliana, if you want to go one at a time. But and again, awareness of a certain issue, this hot topic um, is certainly something we're learning more and more about at many of the events that we've been attending recently, mm -hmm. not just for the digestate, but also um, in, com in finished compost too. Um, and that's part of the research that we're doing to update those white papers um, to learn more about uh, the potential contaminants that could continue to move with that final product and then we're applying on the land and then we're growing our food in it. So how is, how is that all connected? Yeah, thanks, Lana. Um, so I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to answer each of these individually, I guess, but um, where AD has been most successful, I think there are a lot of great examples out there. Um, I would say that most of the, most of like the the data that we collect and, and the sort of research that we do on AD um, is sort of in the aggregate and it's very sort of numbers focused, which isn't always the best metric of success, right? Um, so I would say that we are, we did have a grant program for um, AD, uh, di like digesters that were processing food waste. Um, and that grant opportunity closed a while back, but we're still um, following those grantees and um, and sort of evaluating their successes. And, and success stories from that grant program um, are something that we will be developing in, in the next year would be my guess. Um, some of those projects are still sort of getting up and running. Um, they don't really have a lot to share so far as far as their success stories, um, but but that's something that will be forthcoming. And so we'll, we'll certainly be able to share more, um, more stories about, about that program in particular in places where AD sort of at, at all different levels, right. From, from doing feasibility studies to pilot demonstration projects um, and increased research and that kind of thing has been successful. Um, but that's certainly, you know, something that um, if you wanted to, to reach out and sort of ask for more ideas of where to find um good information and, and, and to see some, um, some good examples of where AD is working, then, then we'd be happy to, you know, help connect you a little bit there. Um, and then increasing concern about toxins P and PFAS and biosolids specifically. Um, we, our part of EPA doesn't work a lot with biosolids. Um, that's mostly the office of water. And, um, I would say that there's, a lot happening, as you know, with PFAS right now, um, including at EPA, there's a lot of work going on. Um, you all probably saw the new drinking water standards that came out recently. So that's an area that that our team is following really closely. Um, again, we're doing you know this updated um, this update to this paper, and so just trying to learn. We're trying to learn more about um, PFAS specifically related to food waste, because again, that's our that's our main focus. Um, so we're just trying to understand more, more the risk, more the concerns. Um, and so hopefully that's, you know, something that, that again, will be coming up pretty soon, that, that research. Um, and if anybody has, you know, if you have resources that you think are, are great papers that you've seen or whatever, then we're always happy to, to read research. We're always happy to, you know, see what, how people are thinking about these things. So feel free to share those. Um, and then identified problematic sites. Again, that wouldn't be our part of EPA. Um, so, so that would, yeah, I would, I wouldn't really be able to answer that specifically. 
Great. Um, thank you. Sorry, I know that was a big question to throw at you at the end. Um, I'll just say that one one thing that is is a little adjacent to this converse to to the the biosolids and the PFAS and toxin conversation is um, that that you did mention that there are going to be some resources coming out promoting and talking about non agricultural use for compost and 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 potentially digestate um, or, or biosolids. I'm not sure what all will be included there, but that's, you know, I'm often um, in conversations where people kind of forget that there are other non-ag uses of compost. And I'm not in, in, in any way promoting that we just contaminate other land, but there are still valuable characteristics as long as it's not high, obviously highly contaminated. PFAS is everywhere. Um, there are some industrial sites where biosolids may have a significantly lower uh, PFAS level than is ambient at an industrial site that could still benefit from the, the organic matter and the biology that comes with compost use and the revegetation and holding that landscape in place. And so I always also just in, would encourage everybody to think more broadly about how we can utilize this end resource and, um, and to just remember that while keeping it certainly off of food producing land might be a highest priority, there's a lot of non-ag land that, that could still benefit um, potentially. And so obviously we're all learning a lot now about these different contaminants of concern and what the acceptable layer uh, levels are, um, but also keeping that in context of what are the ambient levels and what are the benefits that that still uh, certain sites still may uh, be able to to receive and recognize from utilizing this uh, this material. So, just put that out there for people to chew on a little bit. Um, we are at time, so thank you to to our three presenters. Thanks to all of our participants for joining us again today. 